This video is going to cover what is DNS and how does it work. This week I did a lecture on DNS and so this kind of recaps the lecture and kind of expands it a little bit and clarifies some of the items. The video is probably going to take three videos. In the first video I'll talk about the concepts and the theory. In the second video I'll examine DNS using Wireshark. We're going to capture the packets and look inside the packets to see DNS at work. And in the third video, we'll use some tools that we can use to get uh, domain name responses with. We'll use the tools nslookup, dig, and the host command. So we're talking about the domain name system, or DNS. Well, we can all agree that every client on the internet needs these addresses in order to have internet access. They need an IP address, a net mask or subnet mask, a gateway address to reach their router, and then they usually have two DNS servers. In this case, 8.8.8.8 is a DNS server for Google, and this is a backup DNS server that also points to Google. So this would put this client, let's say, on the internet. So the DNS server's role here is, the role of the DNS server is to translate host names to IP addresses. So what is DNS? It's a service that translates host names to IP addresses. It's kind of like a phone book that translates names to phone numbers, but in this case, to IP addresses. And I know, I know, phone book is not a very good analogy. It's pretty old school. But think of the domain name system as we need to translate a name to an address because if you want to go anywhere on the web, it's easier to go to a name. Let's say like you want to go to Yahoo, you go to yahoo.com, but it's a lot harder to just go to an address or an IP address. Imagine you want to go to Google and you have to type in the web browser 216.58.217.36. Not so much fun. Okay, so the reason that we need this name translation is that it's easier to find things using a name. It's easier to remember. So. DNS uses DNS clients and DNS servers. The clients query the DNS servers. So you need to resolve a name, use a DNS client to query a DNS server, and the server responds with the address. The DNS client runs in the background and is used by other protocols like HTTP, FTP, Telnet, and SMTP. DNS is, is running in the background. There's no front-end program for DNS, but like when you're using your web browser, the HTTP protocol will then request that the DNS client go and get the name resolution for whatever website you're trying to go to. DNS is also an application layer protocol at layer 7, and it uses UDP port 53 for transport at the transport layer. DNS involves a hierarchy of DNS servers that use a distributed database. It's like I said, like a giant phone book that has name to IP address mappings. So this hierarchy of DNS servers basically helps it to distribute the load so that we don't just have one DNS server on the internet. Imagine how many computers would be trying to contact that one DNS server to, to resolve names to addresses. It would be impossible. It would be a bottleneck. So we use a hierarchy of DNS servers and a distributed database to get the job done. So here are some of the types of DNS queries that you typically make. Let's say you're going to use a DNS query because you want to go to a web page and you need to resolve the name to an address. Or when you send an email, the mail name, let's say uh, if you're trying to get to admin at danscourses.com, the danscourses.com needs to be translated to an IP address. So it's used for web requests, mail requests, to reach other name servers, and also to resolve aliases or names. And let's see how that works. So for instance, you have a host name like google.com or danscourses.com, and you want to get the IP address for that name, well then you're using a DNS A record, or you need the DNS A record or address record. It means you need the IP address of the host. But let's say you have an alias name like www.google.com or www.danscourses.com. Well, you want to resolve this alias to a canonical name, which is the actual name of the host. 
So in this case, google.com or danscourses.com. That's the actual host name for www version. So in this case, you're going to need a C name record or canonical name record. You need the actual host name from the alias name. Also, you resolve host names to canonical names. Let's say you want to send some mail and you're using Google. Well, you need to resolve the alias google.com, let's say, or danscourses.com, and you need to resolve that, but you need the mail host. You need the canonical name of the mail server. So that resolves in this case, notice it's the same alias or the same host name, but resolves to a different host because you need mail. And that's an MX record. The idea is you need the IP address of the mail server. Ultimately, you need the IP address of the mail server, but in this case, the resolution resolves the name to the host name of the mail server, and then you can do a second resolution to go from the host name of the mail server to the IP address of, let's say, that server. So that might take two, um, two requests. All right, and then the other type is you, need a, you have a host name and you need the DNS uh, name servers. So in this case, danscourses.com, same host name, but in this case, I need to find out who are the authoritative name servers for my website. Well, one of them's ns1.m03.siteground.biz. My site is hosted at SiteGround. And so that uh, the issue is that I need the name and IP address of the name server. So in this case, you're using an NS record. So how are DNS records set up? DNS records are set up in a four tuple. The four tuple, you can see it right here, has the name, value, type, and TTL, which is time to live. So for instance, for name, I need the host name, let's say danscourses.com, and, and then the value is the IP address, and the type of record is an A record. This is used as a forward lookup because we're going from name, dancecourses.com, to the IP address. That's the record I need. I need the name to IP address mapping. We call that an A record, and it's a forward lookup. Or alias to canonical name, a C name record, host name to canonical name, MX record for the mail server, host name to canonical name, which is the actual host name. That's the NS record or name server. And then there's other types of records. There's a quad A record for a forward lookup of a name to the IPv6 address of a host. There's a pointer record, a PTR record, which is the host name from an IP address. So you go from an IP address and you want to resolve the host name. And you have a SOA record or start of authority record, and that's required for each authoritative zone of a domain. So there is a start of authority record. It's maintained by the authoritative DNS server for that domain. Another type is a pointer record, but in a reverse lookup. In this case, in a reverse lookup, you have the IP address and you want to resolve it to the host. In this case, you have the IP address is in reverse here. It's, um, it's actually been reversed and you're looking for the host, which in this case, the reverse order of the IP address now goes from specific to general, where normally it's the other way around, general to specific. And the, go the goal is, is to get the specific host in a reverse lookup from the address. Let's talk more about DNS servers. First of all, uh, DNS servers can be duplicated into master DNS servers and slave DNS servers. But here's the general structure of how DNS servers work on the internet. There are 13 root DNS servers on the internet. And that goes all the way back to what the message format in the reply, a 512 byte reply, they could only have, there was only enough room for 13 records. So the root DNS servers, which have a zone of a dot, and these are the 13, you know, these are the 13, let's say, big phone books. Um, these root DNS servers, uh, there's not actually 13, there's hundreds of them, 
but because of load distribution and any cast addressing, you can have multiple like clones of the servers all responding to the same IP address. That way, you know, it's not, there's not only 13 that you can reach, but there's also the duplicates that you can reach through any cast addressing. Those re root DNS servers have the records to reach the top level domain servers, like there's a DNS server for .com, there's a DNS server for the .org top level domain, and there's DNS servers for like .edu, .net, also for countries, you name it. These are TLD servers, and in their zones, they have the zones for all of the .coms, let's say, or all of the .orgs. At the next level, second level domain servers, you know, top level domain servers, the next level, second level domain servers are authoritative DNS servers for the different domains. So for instance, on my site, danscourses.com, there is a DNS server for my domain name, and that's the authoritative DNS server for that zone, danscourses.com. But there's also an authoritative DNS server for Google, Yahoo, you name it. So every domain has an authoritative server that has the authoritative resource records for that domain. It has the start of authority records for that domain. It knows the IP address. It knows the name servers. It knows all that information. Then at the next level, you have your local DNS servers. The local DNS server in this case refers to, let's say, your ISP or your internet service provider's local DNS server. Now this local DNS server may have no zones. It could be just a caching server that caches addresses, names to addresses, but doesn't have any zones in particular, perhaps. It's a non-authoritative server. If it's just a caching server with no zones, then it's non-authoritative. Then sometimes after the, um, let's say, local DNS server of your internet service provider, some people have their routers having a local DNS server forwarder. This is on the local network. It doesn't have any zones, and its job is just to forward requests. So in this case, right up here, right, my address, let's say if I'm 192.168.1.100, and my gateway is 1.1, sometimes your DNS server will be the same address, 192.168.1.1. So it's, it's like a local DNS server on the network that's just like acting as a forwarding server. Beyond your local DNS server, which may be your router on your local network, you have your end user computer. This is my computer. On my computer, I have a DNS client that, uh, and I also have a stub resolver or DNS resolver, which is usually included in the operating system. And this does the job of basically saying, I need to resolve this, this name to IP address. So you have forwarders, you have resolvers, you have caching servers, you have all these different levels, and they can be um, DNS servers on the internet can have, or on a network can have uh, masters and slaves as backup servers. So let's look at the step-by-step -step process of how it works. So how it works is, my computer, my DNS client, has a request. It needs to resolve a name. Send that request to the local DNS server. Let's say it's on my local network. And then it forwards that request to my ISP DNS server, or local DNS server, my ISP, which is gonna act as a resolver, and it's gonna do an iterative request. So this request here is what we call a, re um, a recursive request. So DNS client here, makes a recursive request. Let me put that in there here. Recursive request. Okay, then the it gets to the internet service provider's DNS server who's gonna resolve this request and it makes iterative requests to first the root DNS server which replies with the top level domain server that's needed, in this case .com. And then the dot, .com TLD DNS server replies with the address of the authoritative zone DNS server for danscourses.com. And then finally, danscourses.com's DNS server replies to the internet service provider's DNS server with the IP address or the record 
of, let's say, the address record for that name to IP address mapping. That gets sent back to the local DNS server and then back to my DNS client with a reply. So it's a request, and then I get a DNS resource record reply. And this is the process. Now you might say, well, that's a lot of information or requests and responses. It would take a long time. You could have a bottleneck. So what happens is a lot of these servers along the way can have cached addresses. So if the ISP DNS server, right, the local DNS server for the ISP, let's say, if it has, it probably has the addresses already or the records of the top level domain servers for .com. So then it doesn't have to contact the root DNS server. So it already knows that information. Then it can go right away and, and talk to this DNS server and skip the root DNS servers and so on and so forth. So caching enables the process to be more efficient. And a lot of caching is done in this scenario. All right, let's take a look at how the DNS header is structured. So the DNS is an application layer protocol at layer seven, but it has a header. It has its own header. And in the header, you have the transaction ID or the transaction identifier. This is a unique identifier that identifies this particular request. Then you have these flags here. And the flags, you have the QR flag, which lets you know if it's a query, a zero, or if it's a one, it's a response. You have the opcode flag to specify whether it's a forward lookup or a reverse lookup. You have the authoritative answer, the truncated field. If recursion is desired, if recursion is available, a Z flag, which is reserved. Let's see here, what else? The authenticated data flag, which is used for DNS sec, for DNS security. And the checking disabled flag, if DNS security is, uh, if no receiver validation is required. You also have this important R code area, which will tell you if there's errors, server errors, if the domain is non-existent, and so forth. Then also in the header is the QD count, or the question count, the answer count, right? How many questions, how many answers, how many authoritative uh, records, how many additional records. So are, this is all contained in you know, how many questions, how many responses or answers did we get? Did we get authoritative records as well? And did we get additional records as well? So this is just the header. If we look at the body or the format of the actual resource record that's returned, you've got these fields, the name field, type, class, TTL, RD length, and RD data. So for example, the resource record that return, the name, let's say is www.danscourses.com. We have an A record request. The class is an internet class. The time to live, 86,400, um, which is, uh, I believe this is seconds, which equals one day. The RD length, four bytes. And then the data that's returned, in this case, the IP address. So very simply, in the resource record, what's returned? The name, let's say it's danscourses.com, the name, and the address. And we know, because it's an A record, internet class, and the time to live value. So this is the format of a resource record and it will follow this format. Now, where did I get this, this cool like ASCII formatting? I got it straight from the RFCs on the web for DNS. So you can look up the RFCs, the request for comments for DNS. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna use Wireshark. We're gonna make some, uh, some DNS uh, requests we're going to make some name uh, requests, and then we're going to look at layer seven and look at the information in the packets returned in Wireshark.